Okay, we're two minutes past three. So uh, I'd like to just say welcome to everyone uh, who's joining us this afternoon for our fourth uh, global webinar in this series. Um, as you know, this series we're devoting to the United States and an understanding of American power, kind of deconstructing, decolonizing American power. And we've, we've conceived of this particular series as a kind of mini course in an understanding of the United States. And uh, we began, as you, some of our more stalwart followers will know, we began with deconstructing American exceptionalism, a kind of bedrock ideology of American power. And then we went on to look at the global racial capitalism and the United States embeddedness in that in the second week. And last week, we looked at race and the role Anglo-Americanism and the Anglosphere have played in the construction of, of a white world order. And we had some really interesting speakers on those themes last week. So this week, we want to look at a theme which very often is neglected in the study of the United States, and that is the role of violence that uh, is played in American power itself. Very often, the United States is seen, particularly in European and North Atlantic circles, as a hegemonic power, and with hegemony seen largely as persuasive, consensus-based, and peaceful. Uh, whereas on the other hand, in very large parts of the rest of the world, it, American power is seen as very violent, coercive, and uh, aggressive. Uh, and the idea that the long peace has been maintained by the liberal international order, which the United States heads, uh, is very alien in very large parts of the world, uh, historically, and also more recently in this century, and even today. Earlier today, I came across a map of the world uh, uh, about American military bases. And there were only eight, four countries in the world in which there are no American troops active at the moment. The rest of the world is in one way or another, uh, uh, has active American troops and they're currently fighting as well. And of course, the American military is the large, one of the largest forces in the world. The Pentagon is absolutely huge in user of resources and American wars uh, and wars in relation to the United States from the very beginning, in a way, America was forged uh, fighting wars itself. And yet that topic, I think, is neglected too much. And what we want to do today is try to correct that a little bit. And we have a wonderful panel, which uh, uh, whom uh, uh, Oz Hassan, our colleague from Warwick and co-organizer and host, will uh, uh, introduce in a moment. And so, as I said, this is a six-week kind of course. And we're basically trying to look at the kind of different elements of American power and different kind of ways in which it, it, its power is exercised in the world. And the global webinar series, if you like, is an attempt quite simply to bring together critical voices from different parts of the world, uh, global South, global majority speakers, who may not always sit in the same room to discuss some of these really interesting questions. So that's what we've been doing. And I think we've done about 40 of these webinars so far. Uh, we have many more plans to do uh, some in the future as well. But with that, I'll hand over to, to Oz to introduce our panel for this afternoon. Thanks, Oz. Thanks, Indy. Um, Javari obviously isn't here this week, um, so I have the honors of um, introducing. Um, and firstly, I just wanna say thank you to all three panelists um, for um, taking the time to do this um, out of your busy schedules, because it's quite a, quite a quite a heavy um, sort of intellectual panel this week. Um, so first off, we're gonna have Uma Purushutaman um, from the Central University of Kerala in India. Um, she's a lecturer in international relations, um, formerly associated with the Observer Research Foundation. And her work focuses on great power politics, soft power, and the United States domestic and foreign policies. After that, we will have um, Jeremy Kuzmarov, um, who's taught at numerous universities across the US, um, is a author of at least four books um, and a social critic. Um, and his main focus is on American history, security and foreign policy. And finally, but not least, uh, we have Kelly Carter Jackson, who's a, a, a professor of American uh, African, sorry, African studies at Wes Wesley College, and she focuses on slavery and the abolitionist violence as a political discourse, historical film and black women's history. So we'll go in that order, if that's OK with everyone, um, the order yeah. of the panel uh, as agreed. Um, Uma, if you'd like to start. Thank you, Oz. Uh, I hope I'm audible, am I? 
Yeah, you are. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for this very, very interesting series on deconstructing uh, American foreign policy. Uh, it's an in indeed a great honor for me to be here. Uh, so when I was asked by Dr. Jaffrey to speak at this event, uh, I initially thought of uh, talking about how the United States has used something as innocuous as aid, as a geopolitical weapon to increase its power. Uh, but then Dr. Jaffrey said that the focus is on violent conflict. So I thought I'd focus on US military aid and its uh, impact. Uh, I thought I'd start off with some facts. One of course is what every one of, every one of us knows that the United States is the largest arms exporter in the world. Uh, the next country after the United States when it comes to arms exports really is Russia, but it only has one third of the United States exports. So the United States had a market share of 39% in international arms exports between 2017 and 2021. The second largest, uh, the next country behind the United States was Russia, which only accounted for 19% of exports during this period. Uh, then if you look at uh, the uh, CIPRI data again, US military spending has surpassed 778 billion in 2020 alone. And again, if you look at the other next countries uh, behind the United States, the United States, of course, spends much more on its military than the next nine highest spending countries combined. So you can see the enormity of uh, you know, US, US uh, military power in, the, in this. Uh, I'll start with a very brief introduction about American aid. Foreign aid is, of course, you know, money, technical assistance, training, commodities that the United States gives to other countries, uh, supposedly, in, the interest, in their interest as well as the interest of the United States. Uh, but most Americans tend to believe that you know, foreign aid is about 25% of US uh, budget, but it's actually very less. It's less than 1%. Uh, the US is, of course, the most generous donor, but it actually gives a much smaller proportion of its GNP compared to other countries like the, uh, you know, the Scandinavian countries, for instance. Uh, so the US uh, military assistance program really began with the Greek Turkish program in 1947, when it was enacted to support the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine, of course, was meant to aid any country which was threatened by communist aggression. Uh, and again, if you look at US uh, modern foreign assistance dates back to the Marshall Plan in 1948. And when the economies of the allies uh, recovered, US aid started becoming transformed into military aid to the NATO partners. And this military aid actually helped to integrate the NATO members into NATO, both pol politically and uh, militarily. It improved the quality of the member states' armed forces. It improved bilateral relations between them and the United States, and it uh, secured their orientation westward in the sense tying them with the United States. Now, of course, the United States has used aid, even humanitarian aid, several times as a geopolitical weapon. Uh, I'll give you a very, very small uh, example of this. In India, for instance, uh, the generation before me has very, very fresh memories of how the United States used food aid on which India was dependent to punish India for uh, India's position on the Vietnam War. And this was in the mid 1960s. Uh, we had had two years of successive droughts uh, and India really needed American uh, wheat under PL 480 and at very low prices because at that point, India you know, was a poor country. We didn't have enough uh, foreign exchange to buy food in the world market. So Mrs. Gandhi uh, had just become prime minister. She went to Washington on an official visit. And of course, she was given a gushing welcome by uh, Lyndon Johnson. And he pr promised that he would give uh, India wheat. But soon after this was the bombing of Hanoi and ha uh, Haipong and India demanded that the bombing st stop. And President uh, Johnson was so enraged that he ordered that food aid was to be given to India only on a case-to-case -case basis, what we later call the short tether policy or the ship to mouth policy. Now, this is just an example of how even, you know, something which looks very innocent, like food aid can also be used to pressurize countries into following what the United States uh, wants uh, them to do. Now, to come back to military aid, uh, if you were to look at where US military aid was going in uh, 2020, you would see all the usual suspects, but interesting, you'd also see Ukraine there. Uh, the topmost re recipient of US aid in 2020 was Israel, which received $3,300 million uh, in military aid from the United States, followed by Afghanistan. Of course, uh, into 2020, the United States was very much in Afghanistan, then followed by uh, several countries in the Middle East, like Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, 
And then you have Ukraine receiving 284 million uh, US dollars. So if you notice none of the names that I mentioned as having received the largest amounts of American aid, except for Ukraine perhaps, would qualify to be real representative democracies which hold, uh, which uphold the law of, uh, rule of law domestically or internationally. So there's obviously some flaw in how the United States chooses who the military or security assistance really goes to. Uh, the United States spent 11 billion in military aid in, the, in 2020 alone. And post 9-11 actually, uh, the number of security assistance programs that the United States had increased. You know, they, before 2000, 2001, there were 57 security assistance programs. Today, there are 107. So it's almost double after 9-11. And interestingly, a lot of these security assistance programs goes not through the State Department, but through the Pentagon. So the Pentagon uh, funds 45 of the 50 new programs which are created, and most of the uh, bulk is focused on counterterrorism. And the, through these programs, the United States uh, has been funding activities, uh, equipment and services in over 160 countries. And uh, interestingly, again, nearly 40% of the defense aid authorities do not require any legal requirement uh, to notify uh, Congress about their activities. And 35% of total US foreign assistance budget goes towards military and non-military security assistance. Uh, Americans, of course, are told by their leadership that it helps uh, mil American military aid, helps to build the capabilities of partner countries. It provides, them, it provides the United States influence over the policies, and it guarantees access to influential institutions and personalities across the globe. I mean, this might well be true, at least uh, partially. But what has this aid really been used for? Uh, the top recipient of US military aid across the years, if you look at it, has been Israel. Israel, of course, has used it not only to secure itself, but also to trample on the rights of the Palestinians. The Egyptian military is using it for its own purposes. The Saudis are us using uh, um, you know, American weapons in, uh, in Yemen. I think that's one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world currently. Uh, it, it's caused over 377,000 deaths and a lot of, about 60% of these deaths are a result of hunger, lack of healthcare and unsafe children and more, more uh, unsafe water. And, more, and sadly, more than 10,000 children have been killed or wounded because of the fighting in Yemen. So the Saudi coalition has been carrying out thousands of airstrikes, killing th tens of thousands of people, according to the UN. And these include, uh, you know, what is called known as double tap attacks, in which you know there is one strike which hits a group of the Houthi rebels, and then the second one hits people who try to go and uh, rescue them. Uh, now, during the Cold War, the United States provided uh, military and economic aid to a number of countries which violated uh, human rights. In the 70s, the Congress tried to enact statutes to curtail this, but then this was honored, not really honored. Uh, for instance, in 1977, Guatemala witnessed government-sponsored political murder, torture, disappearances, and in the early 1980s alone, uh, around 36,000 to 72,000 Guatemalan uh, adults were killed. And the United States bears a lot of responsibilities for these tra tragedies. In 1954, it had directed the overthrow of uh, President Jacoba Arbenz. Since then, the United States has Voted with arms as well as with uh, money and series of brutal regimes. Uh, the Reagan administration used aid to support governments in Latin America, opposing leftist groups and uh, backing right-leaning groups like the Contras, which are fighting the Sandinista government in uh, Nicaragua. Uh, then, of course, you have the example of Afghanistan. After the Soviet invasion, you have uh, the CIA under Operation Cyclone providing weapons along with money to the Mujahideen through the Pakistani intelligence services the longest, most covered CIA operation ever undertaken and more than $20 billion in US funds was funneled into Afghanistan to train and arm <coughs> the Mujahideen, sorry. So the US built, uh, you know, anti-aircraft missile, the Stinger missile, which was supplied to the Mujahideen, uh, really struck a decisive blow to the Soviets. But then see what happened to the country after the Mujahideen won uh, and see what happened to the women after that. Even after 2001, the United States has dispersed uh, almost 73 billion in military aid to Afghanistan between 2001 and 2020. Uh, and despite the United States having provided the Afghan military forces with uh, equipment, training services, salaries, you know, it fold, the Taliban took just about you know four hour, four four months to take over Afghanistan and control uh, 
Kabul and so much for the for all the money which was spent on training the Afghan uh, armed forces. Uh, after the 9-11 attacks, the uh, strategic purpose of US aid once again has appeared front and center. It, it is being used as a key tool of national power and to guard against the threat of terrorism. Uh, aid has been used on the battlefield to support US strategic uh, arms and the defense community in the United States sees aid as uh, useful in dealing with political violence in Iraq and Afghanistan and shaping you know, security environments everywhere. So the United States allocates uh, security assistance uh, to improve its competitive advantage and also to maintain uh, market share dominance among you know, arms important countries. You know, once you send in arms, to, mil arms as military to a country, it will uh, uh, perforce continue to buy arms from them because you know, they are more familiar with those uh, weapons, you know, similar, uh, familiar with those weapons. It's like how India continues to depend on uh, Russian arms uh, not because they are superior to American or other Western arms, but because we are used to, uh, you know, using uh, uh, Russian arms. Uh, so, what has been the impact of U.S. Uh, military aims uh, aid? Uh, you know, there have been some attempts by the United States to use uh, military aid to influence the behavior of recipient states, but this has really not worked. For instance, uh, during Obama's administration, uh, <clears throat> President Obama had suspended some types of military assistance to Egypt in 2013. But that did not lead to any you know, progress in democratic reforms, for instance. Uh, the United States tried uh, putting a four, 4 billion arms package for Bahrain on hold, hoping to uh, see an improvement in the human rights environment. Again, that did not happen. The, the problem with uh, US military aid really is that you know, the unintended consequence is that it improves the ability of a state, particularly repressive regimes, to oppress the social and political rights of their people. And again, this kind of aid can also weaken a country if, if these resources are diverted to non-state actors or you know, guerrilla groups by exacerbating conflicts because of the links between the military and you know, informal armed militias in countries like Colombia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And this undermines uh, domestic political institutions and weakens uh, the state's monopoly on legitimate use of violence. Uh, to come to the more recent case of Ukraine, and 2000, since 2014, the United States has provided over 2.5 billion in military aid to Ukraine. <coughs> of course, this has increased, you know, more than 3 billion has been sent since the invasion on, uh, since the Russian invasion on 24 February. And only last week, I think the US House of Representatives uh, passed nearly 40 billion, uh, a 40 billion dollar package for Ukraine. <laughs> a lot of this includes provision of, you know, trainers, defense systems, uh, you know, javelin, anti-tank missiles. But I think uh, I suspect that the Ukrainians will ultimately have to pay for much of this aid uh, to keep the American uh, military industrial complex in business. So, who does the uh, U.S. military aid <laughs> really benefit? I think it's an important question which needs to be asked. Of course, it primarily benefits the military industrial complex, which. Uh, President Eisenhower uh, warned of long ago in 1961 during his farewell speech. And in recent years, I think the US uh, arms industry has been registering record profits. To the American uh, voters, the arms industry is sold as something which generates uh, jobs. But the point is that most, uh, most economists would agree that you know, investments in other industries are probably more efficient job uh, generators. In 2016, the uh, Pentagon uh, issued $304 billion in contract awards to corporations, which is nearly half of the budget of the Pentagon, $600 billion plus uh, budget. And the biggest ben beneficiaries were, of course, you know, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, General Dynamics, um, et cetera. And many of these companies are very, very dependent on the government uh, for, for uh, you know, contracts. Uh, so the Department of Defense it's, itself is becoming more of a you know aid donor. It is it's it's also becoming an implementing agent. Uh, so the military industrial complex has become uh, very much part of the commercial, economic, uh, social, and political part of the United States system. It's become so integrated that you cannot really separate it from the system. Uh, and the military industrial uh, complex tends to be a catalyst for conflicts and wars, and it continues to instigate cause future conflicts, crises, and strife. A uh, uh, driving factor behind this relationship is that, you know, both sides benefit. One side is getting weapons, the other side is getting money for being uh, paid to supply them. Uh, 
Uh, and then, of course, the uh, arms industry's uh, investment in lobbying is very, very impressive. I think there was a report which said that since 2009, uh, the defense sector has spent uh, more than $1 billion on lobbying. And the lobbyists, of course, are former congressmen, congresswomen, think tankers. Uh, so the military industrial complex uh, treats war as a business, you know, to uh, get more and more money out of the US uh, government. So, so therefore, the decisions on defense allocation, arms production are motivated by desires for profit, personal power, and not necessarily by security uh, requirements. And so what really gets lost in the debate uh, over the economic consequences of military spending is the effect that it has on international stability. You know, if, if a lot of scholars have found out that the most effective way of convincing the American public of the need of a large military establishment is to constantly discover new threats. So, so after the Cold War, you had this new threat, which is global uh, terrorism. And now, of course, you have uh, uh, Russian uh, aggression. Uh, so in conclusion, I think the United States has really used uh, military aid to prop up allies. And some of those allies are not particularly, uh, you know, benevolent allies, let's say, uh, to initiate conflicts and to make conflicts enduring. Uh, but sometimes, you know, this aid itself has hit back at the United States. For instance, uh, arming the Mujahideen in, the, in Afghanistan did not turn out to be a very smart strategy. Again, sometimes this aid has been used by American allies to browbeat their opposition and carry out, you know, human rights abuse, like in the cases, uh, like in the case of the Middle East during the Arab Spring. Uh, the United States has also used, <coughs> sorry, has also used military aid for promoting arms sales and ensuring uh, future arms sales to support its defense industrial base. And then if you go by history, the United States is probably very well on its way to increasing its overall military aid in the, com in the coming years to countries which will help it to contain China and Russia. I think the only winner really in the increasing quantity of military aid is the military industrial complex, which continues to influence US policy. Uh, so military, uh, so the United States has used uh, its military, U, the US military aid has been used to perpetuate violence across the globe, despite being guised under very, very lofty aid, uh, very, very lofty aims, contributing in effect to the uh, violent century. Uh, and I think uh, I, my view personally about the Ukraine conflict is that, you know, there is no real uh, effort on the part of the West or of course, uh, Russia to end this conflict because you know it, it, uh, it's probably because of the influence of the uh, military complex. And also because you know, they seem to want to uh, use this whole, uh, you know, this whole war to uh, weaken Russia rather than to you know, come, uh, finish, uh, finish and end this conflict and uh, bring stability to that, re uh, to that region. I'll end here. Thank you for listening. <coughs> Thank you very much, Omar. And get yourself a glass of water. Um, and uh, clear your throat a little bit. Thank you so much for your talk, really interesting. Lots of uh, questions, um, but we'll wait for that uh, until we've heard from Jeremy and from Kelly. So uh, with that, I'll hand over to Jeremy. Jeremy, you've got the floor for about 20 minutes as well. Thanks very much. Great, well, thanks for uh, having me and allowing me to join this uh, great group. Uh, you know, today there are talks of major geopolitical shifts in the world. And the U.S. Uh, looks more and more like a declining empire. Uh, thus, the time may be uh, ripe uh, for uh, scholars to begin an, an assessment uh, of the American century. Uh, the uh, U.S. field, you know, which again may be coming to an end, the U.S. field of diplomatic history has largely been in denial about the imperial character of the United States, although hopefully uh, this may be beginning to change. Uh, I would argue that the American century and empire uh, even compared to other empires, as uh, I think a previous speaker was uh, noting, was particularly violent and uh, noted for uh, a time, you know, gratuitous uh, violence. And I think this is captured in a film uh, that many of you probably have seen, Apocalypse Now, which I think is a brilliant film uh, that shows this gratuitous uh, violence used by the United States in Vietnam. And I think it's also epitomized by the uh, dropping of the senseless bombing of Afghanistan, particularly the dropping of the mother of all bombs by Donald Trump was just this kind of character of a weapon, a super weapon uh, that was totally impractical militarily. It was just a display of violence. Uh, and to me, that sums up the character of the American empire. Uh, 
uh, and this you know, is not surprising for anybody who studied American history. Uh, it's a very violent history, and particularly towards you know, Native Americans and African Americans. Now, one other feature of the United States uh, uh, is that the country was founded as a republic, as a republic in an anti-colonial rebellion. So I think the central paradox in American history is that you have the evolution of this great empire, but the country's identity is predicated as that of a republic. Uh, and there's a tr tremendous stigma to empire and colonialism. As such, the US has ruled more indirectly than other empires and has kept a lot of its uh, uh, nefarious activities secret uh, to the public and tried to cover it up, I think more so than other empires. And uh, therein lies the significance, I think, of the police training program that I uh, chronicled in my book, uh, yeah, uh, Modernizing Repression, Police Training and Nation Building in the American Century, which was published by the University of Massachusetts Press. And the, these uh, yeah, programs, yeah, again, were key to that dichotomy uh, of the US uh, advancing its power by a more secretive way uh, and kind of hiding its imperial pretensions before its population. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a lot of the violence was subcontracted to proxy forces and, you know, dirty work of empire was subcontracted, which was true of most empires, but I think even more so uh, in the American case. Um, and yeah, I mean, my book goes back to the colonial Philippines. It was really formative uh, in the development of the American empire and the development of these police programs. <laughs> and that uh, chapter, yeah, is the first chapter in my book and it builds off a excellent study by Alfred McCoy uh, called Policing America's Empire. And McCoy, I think is one of the few who's really tried to study the US as an empire uh, in, in the field of, of diplomatic history, which is largely still uh, in denial uh, and, and often very uh, conservative uh, field. But uh, McCoy's study uh, looks at how the U.S. developed, and I, you know, build off him, uh, and you know, did some of my own research as well uh, on that topic and others. But yeah, I mean, he shows how the U.S. you know got bogged down into like a Vietnam type quagmire, and the war you know became unpopular at home, especially as uh, there were reports of torture, you know, and this is kind of eerily reminiscent of later in the Vietnam War and then the Iraq War with the Abu Ghraib because the U.S. public, you know, again, sees itself not as an empire. And so when they see U.S. forces behaving like imperial forces, you know, carrying out torture, uh, they, you know, they get very upset and they demand the, you know, re removal of U.S. troops. So the U.S. strategy in the Philippines, and at that time there was an anti-imperialist league, which I think different from our own time, uh, there was a vibrant anti-imperialist movement that included many senators and Mark Twain, you know, some very prominent writers and intellectuals. And, you know, they saw the U.S. behaving like an empire and, and they were, they didn't want anything uh, to do with that. And they were at the forefront of demanding the return of U.S. troops from the Philippines, which the, um, um, well, the Roosevelt administration uh, undertook that policy, but it left a residual military force to train the Philippine constabulary to basically uphold U.S. interests and power in the Philippines, which included, uh, you know, establishing a, a coaling station, uh, a, um, a naval base, and, you know, accessing the economic resources, allowing U.S businesses uh, to go into the Philippines. So those interests were looked after by this uh, government that the U.S. helped to install. Uh, initially, it was you know governing commission led by American, but gradually it was Filipinized. But then the, the American military advisor stayed on to train this uh, Filipino constabulary to you know basically uh, uh, complete the pacification efforts against the nationalist forces. And there are some you know messianic peasant rebellions and the countryside as well, Muslim, Muslim rebellion <laughs> in Moral Land. Uh, so the constabulary suppressed often quite violently uh, the remnants of these rebellions and established U.S. power in the Philippines. And that became a model in uh, South America. The U.S. You know, went into Haiti and Nicaragua. And I have chapters in the book that detail uh, those operations. At that time, it was the U.S. military 
It was you know, a small military force that was either sent or left in the country from larger military interventions that would train const a constabulary uh, basically to enforce American power. And it was a kind of light footprint approach that we also see you know, in the war on terror and other uh, military interventions, even in Ukraine. Uh, today. And it was successful from an American point of view because it installed pro-American governments. In the case of Nicaragua, you know, it, uh, the constabulary worked to suppress the uh, uh, movement led by Augusto Cesar Sandino, uh, who is a nationalist, uh, kind of more left-wing, um, and his forces were crushed violently. Uh, in that case, yeah, the U.S. helped to uh, entrench, I mean, the danger, you know, the U.S. claimed they were there to spread democracy, but these constabularies ultimately warped democratic development in those countries. Uh, and a good example is Nicaragua, where the head of the National Guard that the U.S. was financing and training, Anastasio Somoza, seized power for himself and established a family dictatorship uh, for decades after crushing Sandino. And he lasted until the, the Sandinista revolution in 1979. Uh, and then you know, going forward, my book yeah, shows a continuity. I, I think one contribution I try and make is to, because often I think a flaw in the field of diplomatic history is to look at the Cold War period in isolation and to look at US policy as a uh, defensive maneuver against you know, Soviet aggression or expansion. Uh, actually in another book, uh, The Russians Are Coming Again, I kind of debunk that narrative and show the US was always aggressive toward Russia, having invaded Russia in 1917 after the Russian Revolution uh, and uh, you know, provoked the Russians in, in many ways and basically uh, uh, you know, created that conflict with the Russians. Uh, and you know, in Modernizing Repression, I try and show that the Cold War uh, police training program built off the pre precedent of the earlier period, you know, the early uh, 20th century program in the Philippines and Nicar uh, Nicaragua, you know, Central Latin America, and there's a strong degree of continuity, although the main difference was that the police program in the Cold War period were run out of civilian agencies. Uh, they were largely, C it was largely CIA run program under the cover of the USAID, United States Agency of International Development, which a way to, was to kind of keep secret and create this kind of um, a humanitarian veneer behind policy that were really very coercive. And uh, a key program was in Japan, actually a formative program in the Cold War years was in Japan right after World War II, when under Douglas MacArthur, a large police training program was established. Uh, and one of the uh, police advisors was named Byron Engel, who later came to head the uh, Office of Public Safety. Uh, and initially, there was some effort, you know, to root out the you know militarists, uh, uh, you know, who had ruled Japan in the 1930s uh, and 40s, uh, and to install a more democratic standard in the police that would uphold civil liberties. Uh, and they did take some police reformer, like you know, they would send police officers to work with the police department. They would import, you know, new technologies to upgrade and modernize their policing capabilities. And they would try and, uh, you know, promote uh, new, new reforms and standards. Uh, so initially they were trying to uh, end torture practices by the Japanese police. And they took some uh, police officers uh, and prison officials in the US who had pretty good records of promoting reforms in US police institutions. Some had been students or associated with August Vollmer was the uh, father of American law enforcement who developed a more progressive standards for the police force in Berkeley, California, where the police had to have uh, education. Uh, he established a program at the University of uh, California, Berkeley uh, for, you know, to train them. Uh, so they would uphold professional standards and he rooted out torture in police in the third degree. And so there was some idealistic uh, element behind the program, but it was tied to these larger imperial designs. And very quickly in Japan, what happened is that with the threat of communism, the police uh, training program shifted from a focus of advancing civil liberties to rooting out the communists. And it, it came to focus more on political policing instead of just trying to you know, improve the police so you establish a professional police for, for a democratic government. The focus became on rooting out the Japanese Communist Party, which was fairly influential because the communists had been jailed and opposed the militarists during World War II. And like uh, I did a lot of research at the National Archives and 
uh, it was interesting because they planted spy like this is the the origins i think of the mass surveillance state where they're spying on everybody uh and they you know they reinvigorated those elements in the japanese toko the secret police uh that had carried out mass surveillance you know during world war ii in the late 30s uh so they're really promoting this mass surveillance state in japan and like this initial concern with you know rooting out torture uh, and even like they, they had sent pr prison officials to um clean up the prison and you know ensure like the prisons would promote rehabilitation and they would have job training and recreation and baseball games and it would be a better environment so they could really rehabilitate people in prison and prepare them for life uh, outside uh, but that standard, the focus became uh, uh, all on rooting out the communists. And so they infiltrated the Japanese Communist Party, surveilled on them, and they started uh, carrying out roundup campaigns. And so they uh, had many political prisoners, and that undercut the prison reform because the prison became overcrowded. Uh, and that was the pattern. You know, once the Cold War mindset set in, and, and you could argue that the Cold War was basically a rationalization or excuse to expand U.S. hegemony, because the the U.S. was after World War II, as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Parmar was pointing out, they had you know the U.S. had military bases all over the world, including huge number of military bases in Southeast Asia. So it's very convenient to say, oh, we have to fight the communists. And that was a way to justify this huge military presence and imperial presence in Southeast Asia. And they could justify supporting repressive governments uh, and repressive methods targeting the communists who really groups, you know, communists was often, I mean, there were, you know, communist parties uh, in that era that the communist movement was very viable uh, political movement. And with the communists who were the one protesting U.S. You know, military hegemony uh, and challenging uh, U.S. imperialism in Southeast Asia. So uh, and this was a pretext basically to carry out repression against anybody opposed to the American imperial project in Southeast Asia. And they kind of honed the methods in Japan of, of mass surveillance and promoting more coercive interrogation methods, abandoning the uh, approach of August Vollmer, which was to outlaw torture and promoting or, or uh, accepting torture in interrogation. And uh, these police advisors who served in Japan and were involved in this repressive campaign against the Japanese Communist Party, which in, in, uh, politically resulted in the institutionalization of the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, which dominated uh, Japanese politics for years thereafter, a lot of these advisors went uh, after to Korea, uh, where they helped to uh, prop up the government of Sigmund Rhee that carried out a large scale campaign of repression against communists and leftist forces in South Korea, even starting before the Korean War 1950. Uh, and there were huge uh, human rights abuses that went on uh, there. And the US uh, advisors, uh, you know, police advisors work with some extremely repressive and brutal police chiefs in South Korea, uh, extending through the Korean War and thereafter. And there are a huge number of political prisoners. Uh, and then that was a precedent for the uh, huge atrocities that went on associated with these programs in Vietnam, where a lot of the same advisors, including this guy Engel, who ended up heading the whole organization, carried out the same work of, of upgrading, you know, modernizing the police forces. Uh, a lot of what they're doing was uh, helping to update like record keeping and installing like computers and new technologies that was ultimately used to develop like blacklists and to basically uh, systematize uh, the police repression targeting left-wing communist groups that challenge US hegemony and want more autonomy uh, for their countries. Uh, and, you know, Vietnam, it ultimately aroused the public uh, outrage because the abuses of the program were exposed under the Phoenix Project, which evolved out of these earlier police programs, because you had the police, uh, uh, in theory, the, you know, a democratic police force is non-political uh, and, and upholds civil liberties. Now the ideal, but with the Cold War pretext, the U.S. strayed from that. Uh, and basically mobilize the police for political repressive campaign targeting the communists. Um, and yeah, under the Phoenix program, there were mass uh, roundups uh, and torture was being carried out against dissidents, uh, including civilians. And the, the jails were vastly overcrowded because the US was helping to manage this vast 
uh, you know, roundup campaign. And uh, the reports, like I spent a lot of time at the National Archive reading these reports where they, they, uh, they didn't foresee this problem that they were arresting so many people that they, they couldn't house them. The jails were so overcrowded uh, an advisor would give a report saying we have to start cooking at like four in the morning because there's so many mouths to feed. And I, I think they weren't getting enough food. And in the facility, there were too many people. They had to sleep uh, on top of each other. Uh, some of the facilities didn't have, uh, because there were corruption in the government, they were stealing some of the money that was budgeted for the prison. So the prison was poorly constructed. Uh, some, they were overrun by rats and vermin and disease outbreaks developed in these jails. And you know, then there was also the infamous tiger cages where they were putting some of them underground and only feeding them you know, gruel once a day. Uh, so it evolved into uh, something not far removed from like uh, Nazism where uh, there are people practically in concentration. You know, it's almost the level of a concentration camp minus the gas chamber. Uh, so you know, and this was exposed. The, the US public became outraged by this. Uh, much like with, uh, in some ways with the Philippines. And there was abuses going on in Latin America as well. I don't have time to get into, but uh, you know, eventually th that office was closed. Um, but you know, then gradually the US found other agencies to continue police training programs uh, as a mechanism for advancing US power. Uh, so you know, for the sake of time, uh, just to wrap up, yeah, I mean, these programs elucidate the violent nature of the American century uh, because the US was importing uh, you know, technologies that were used for oppressive purposes and promoting uh, uh, coercive interrogation methods and creating human rights catastrophes in numerous countries. Um, and that's unfortunately the pattern of the American century. And this was kind of all you know, carried out quietly under the radar of the American public until some of the abuses got exposed in the Vietnam War. And at that time, there was kind of a rouse um, politically conscious you know, citizenry um, for a brief period. But then they were effective once the, the agency was officially closed down, but the US government found new way new agencies to run these kind of programs. And we've seen you know, new rounds of abuses in the war on terror. And probably more will come out about Ukraine. There's uh, information that the CIA had been involved in training the Ukrainian Secret Service, who is uh, kidnapping uh, and arresting uh, the dissidents against the Zelensky government. You know, Zelensky banned 11 parties. And um, you know, mayors are being targeted who are favoring negotiation because the last speaker said uh, the, the US doesn't want diplomacy. And the Ukrainian government is actually uh, kidnapping and carrying out these Phoenix style operations, uh, targeting a distance in Ukraine, and including, you know, figured like mayors who want to, you know, more pro-Russian or want to negotiate with the Russians. Some have been executed. And you know, Douglas Valentin is an expert on the Phoenix project. Uh, who wrote the book called The Phoenix Program. And he's written a, a bit about Ukraine. Uh, and I've talked to him, I, I did a few articles for Covert Action Magazine based on interviews with him, describing what we know about what's going on in Ukraine. And he believed, yeah, that the CIA behind it. Uh, and there is evidence again that the CIA apparently had a whole floor of the Secret Service offices. Uh, so uh, in short, if you link it to the history, the, it's a very violent history, uh, and in some way it's tied to American culture. And uh, I think a you know, historian will see that the American, you know, uh, on the point about American exceptionalism, the only way America's exceptionalism is that it may even be more violent than other. I mean, other empires are horribly violent, as people in this group know, committed huge atrocities. Uh, uh, you know, the British Empire, as one example. Unfortunately, the American Empire may be exceptional that it's in some way even more violent than an empire like the British Empire. And yeah, America is a society of extreme. There's a lot of wealth, technological advancement. There is opportunity and a lot of good things about society, but there's a lot of dark side of American life. And that uh, is reflected in, in the character of American leadership in the world. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jeremy. That was amazing. A really big, very large scale kind of coverage in different uh, examples, different countries as well. And I think when you say about the British Empire not being as violent perhaps as the American, I think the systematic hiding 
uh, from the public of uh, the British Empire's work in Africa, especially, and particularly during the 1950s, when the uh, revolutionary and nationalist movements were breaking out in all parts of Africa, uh, and the systematic destruction of civil service, colonial office, and other records, uh, which would uh, which would have um, implicated the uh, Britain in those things. So, but that's not to take away from the point you're making that these liberal order building um, states uh, have committed very, very large numbers of crimes and you've described so many of them. Sort of interesting questions uh, arise from your comments. Uh, we'll get to those hopefully a bit later on, but uh, thank you so much for your contribution. We'll move on to Kelly now, please. Uh, Kelly, you have about 20 minutes. I know you have some slides to show. So I do, we'll, I do. Over to you. I'm going to, uh, before I share my uh, slide, just say I'm, I'm really happy to be here and to be in conversation with you all. And um, this is um, the paper I'm presenting today is really a, an aspect, um, a really dwindled down aspect of a larger book project that I'm writing about um, called The Remedy. And it's about Black responses to, um, to white violence within the United States, um, but also broadening it as well. So, um, let me share my screen with you all. And um, here we go. Okay. So um, my great grandmother, oh, hold on one second. I wanna just take out my, I have a second, um, I have a second monitor, which is why um, I feel like my, okay, cancel, uh-oh. Can you? Uh, you're muted, Kelly. Oh, no. Hold on one second. Um, oh, no. What happened? Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you, but we yep. can't see any uh, slides. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Sorry. I was worried. I was worried. Oh, yeah. No, no. We can uh, hear you. Oh gosh. It's okay. I need to make sure that my microphone. Okay. Now let's try this again. <laughs> so, could it. you see my screen when I was sharing it? Yes. Yes. We could. could. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. All right. So. Um. So, okay. Here we go. So. My great grandmother, Ernesta, was about nine years old when she stepped on a rusty nail. Not long after infection set in, she likely contracted tetanus, a serious bacterial uh, infection that causes painful muscle spasms and can lead to death if untreated. Growing up black and a girl in rural Alabama in 1915 left her vulnerable. Her mother, Mary Bullard, um, was frantic. Ernesta was her only child, and she was afraid that she was going to lose her if she did not act quickly. So Mary sent Ernesta to the only doctor that she knew, a white man who lived in a big house on the other side of town. The white doctor offered to help her, but in exchange, Ernesta would have to live with him for the rest of her life and work for his family. Mary, not wanting to lose her daughter to death, agreed. These were the detestable but um, predictable terms of engagement. Thankfully, Ernesta's grandmother, a former slave, intervened and refused the doctor's barbaric and unconscionable proposal. She refused what Charles Mills coined the racial contract. She picked up her ailing granddaughter and took her home. There, she administered every natural remedy at her disposal. Ernesta survived, but for the rest of her life, she walked with a limp. Whatever space she entered, whatever path she took, she was marked by a violent racial imprint. This story has always gripped me for several reasons. First, nearly 50 years out of slavery, white folks still felt entitled to Black labor and life in perpetuity. Second, Ernesta was a child and her mother's only child. How could a doctor refuse a dying child medical care when it was in her, his ability to heal her? He had abandoned his oath, prenum non non or first do no harm. 
Built into the deal was a lifetime of servitude, subordination, and likely physical and sexual abuse. White supremacy in America can be summed up in these two diabolical options, live a life in bondage or refuse and limp. The crippling is the constant reminder that Black people were withheld from medical care. My great grandmother's outcome had nothing to do with biology and everything to do with power. The violence of white supremacy is both the intent to commit harm and harmful neglect. My new book project is not about the white doctor and the many people like him, but in many ways, this doctor, this book is about my great great, great grandmother, her response, her refusal. It is about her remedy to save my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, myself, and my daughter. White supremacy at its core and its symptoms and its indirect manifestations is violence. Literary critic, Sandy, uh, literary critic Sandy Alexander described anti-Blackness racism that arises from white supremacy as, quote, not merely a thorn in a person's side, but it is also a suffocating knee on a person's neck. She says, quote, racism is in fact a serial killer. This is not sensationalism. This is not hyperbole. We can very easily find that white people's racism has killed Fred Hampton, Henry Dumas, Amadou Diallo, Oscar Grant, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Shanta Bland, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, Atatiana Jefferson, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, David McGanty, and many, many more. And this is only the list of those who are killed from the racism of police brutality. For Alexander, anti-Black racism has been on a killing spree. And during the summer of 2020, she argues racism was so distracting, it deprioritized a whole global pandemic, the gall. Furthermore, racism has been so flagrantly murderous that it is absolutely no qualms about being caught on camera. The remedy makes a case for how we might understand Black humanity and rage in the pursuit of freedom. White violence is the perennial stumbling block to American democracy and racial progress. But this book is not about how white supremacy has impacted the Black community. Rather, this is a book that illustrates the Black community's response to racial violence. Too often, we have exclusively examined white supremacy's terrorism against Black lives, from slavery to massacres like Tulsa and mob attacks and lynchings. We know well the harm that has been inflicted on Black people in their attempts to live full and free lives. Historically, we have touted nonviolence as the appropriate, acceptable, and most suitable form of resistance. And yet freedom, that is to say full citizenship and enfranchisement, has not yet arrived for Black Americans. I contend that white supremacy should not necessarily be met with nonviolence, but revolution. And I contend that the opposite of violence is not nonviolence. In America, the opposite of violence is the fullness of Black humanity. The opposite of violence is not power transferred, but rather power relinquished. A revolution, while used as a liberal trope, as the overthrow of the status quo or the creation of a utopian society, is filled with force and violence. But ultimately, a revolution is forfeiture, plain and simple. And it is impossible to write a book that offers a critical analysis on violence and does not interrogate white supremacy as its lead perpetrator. So a remedy, which is the title of this book, a remedy is a treatment for diseases. Remedies tend to have organic and homegrown connotations to them. It is a concoction of sorts. A treatment is an option with a positive result, but it's not necessarily a cure. There is no cure for racism. And anyone who tells you they can end uh, racism is selling snake oil. Anyone who comes to you and is like, I've got a three point plan for ending racism like that. <laughs> that's not going to happen. There is always someone who, don't, who won't do right, who refuses to stop harm. And it pains me to say that Black Americans and the global poor and depressed may always limp. Our gait is forever changed. But healing is possible.
So I've developed four categories, perhaps not exhaustive, but four ways for understanding Black responses to white supremacy. The first is revolutionary violence, protective violence, gun violence, and joyful violence. Each aspect is a response to the violence of white supremacy, and each response builds upon the other and informs how we might think about confronting white violence and dismantling structural racism. A deep and nuanced conversation on the history and implications of white violence is overdue. For too long, we have dismissed the rock thrower and the looter. Indeed, American uh, revolutionary martyr Crispus Attucks was accused of throwing sticks. We have failed to examine the violence that Black people are responding to in their communities. Interestingly, it was John F. Kennedy who once said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. The responsibility of nonviolence is for oppressors, not the oppressed. Moreover, Black people intimately understand the utility of riotous rebellion. Violence compels a response. Violence disrupts the status quo and the possibility of returning to business as usual. So often the watershed moments of historical record are stamped by violence. It is the engine that propels society along from funerals to fury and from moments to movements. Revolutionary violence explains what is a revolution? What does it entail? What does it mean? What makes revolutions truly revolutionary? In the age of revolutions in the West, I discussed the Haitian Revolution as a model for Black liberation. Haiti has much to teach the world. It is the only Black independent nation to successfully overthrow a European power and free its enslaved people. Emancipation was not merely an aspect of revolution. It was revolution. Frederick Douglass rightly claimed, we should not forget that the freedom that you and I enjoy today is largely due to the brave stand taken by the Black sons and daughters of Haiti 90 years ago. Striking for their freedom, they struck for the freedom of every Black man and woman in the world. We cannot measure independence without reckoning with independence from slavery. The abolitionists did not seek to reform slavery, but to abolish it. Revolutionary violence allows us to replace old systems with new ones. And outside of the Civil War and emancipation, Americans have never experienced a racial revolution, only racial reform. This chapter examines three revolutions in the age of revolution. So I look at Haiti, I look at Guadeloupe, and I look at the United States. And I explore the success of the Haitian Revolution, the failure of Guadeloupe, and the incompleteness of the United States in their attempts to employ revolutionary violence and create new terms for full humanity for everyone. At the core of revolution is change, not violence. The real truth is that revolution will not necessarily be revolutionary. For many, the revolution is clean water, good health, decent shelter, equitable schools, safety, and the like. Revolution looks a lot like everyday life for white Americans. The radicalness of revolution is not bloodshed. It's forfeiture, particularly from those who are hoarding. So the next aspect of this is protective violence. And I look at how protective violence explains the collective defense tactics taken up by black abolitionists. My book moves pretty uh, chronologically starting with the colonial period in the 19th century and 20th and 21st century. In the 19th century, protective violence allowed black abolitionists and activists and ordinary leaders in the black community to protect themselves. It was not self-defense per se, but a collective act to protect the oppressed and their vulnerable kin and the community. Protective violence was about stealing security and procuring safeguards that often circumvented the law. And during slavery, protective violence served as an umbrella in which force was employed in writings and speeches and threats and financial support or withdrawal, shelter and fugitive slaves, or in extreme cases, murder. Each prong was a viable uh, canopy for protecting and advocating for enslaved, as well as undermining or dismantling the institution of slavery. 
In the 20th and 21st century, protective violence combated against local and state violence. Black veterans returning from war often fought back against the racism that terrorized their lives. And white uh, mob attacks from white terrorists were always met with resistance. And I think this is really important because we talk um, in history classes, American history classes about, you know, Red Summer and the summer of 1919 and how black soldiers returned to war fighting basically another war, a racial war, and that all across the country, you know, Black communities are being attacked, uh, like we see in Tulsa or like we see in Rosewood. And uh, we never have the, the second half of that discussion, which is how does Black people, how do Black people respond to that violence? How do they resist that violence? So the third aspect of this book is gun violence. And gun violence illustrates the rich and deep history African-Americans have had with arms. For Black people, the gun is sacred and equally important effective. Gun violence thwarted white mobs and plots to destruct Black property and kill Black people. Gun ownership and gun violence was often a direct threat to undermining white people's monopoly on individual and collective protection. White supremacy meant Black people could be harmed without recourse. The employment of gun violence by Black Americans meant that they were entitled to defend their humanity and ultimately their citizenship. For white Americans, guns are birthed in romance. They're a long and lasting relationship. Guns are like a loving partner that they can openly hold hands with in public spaces. Denying certain white people guns is like denying them a romantic partner. It is denying them power. And white supremacy cannot navigate a world without power, and a gun is a tangible representation of power. And in the United States, there is a reason that the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, and the Second Amendment being the right to bear arms. It is high priority for white people. So for many Black Americans, guns are secrets, undisclosed affairs kept in closets or secret compartments of pocketbooks regulated as grown folks' business. Almost like a mistress, guns are never paraded or broadcasted. And it is not because of shame, but there was safety and discretion. Too often, history has cloaked gun black, by gun, um, black gun violence as an outlier or as an exception to nonviolence. But even during the long freedom struggle, Guns were part of how Black people understood liberation. And you could add a lot of other books to this. You could add Robin Kelly's Hammer and Ho. You could add um, uh, um, uh, Hassan Jeffrey's book that's really good. Um, but guns played central roles. Sometimes guns, um, sometimes guns played central roles, and sometimes guns were merely warning shots fired in the air to quickly quail the violent desires of a mob. There's a myriad of ways to evoke protective violence, but guns were the ultimate protection in the 20th century. And guns, when used as a tool for liberation, never pursue people or create victims. In response to white terrorism, guns do not start trouble, they stop trouble. This is the most important difference in white supremacy and black liberation. The sole purpose of black gun violence is to halt white violence and suppress it. So it's not about revenge. It's not about like destroying and killing all white people. It is about using protective violence and gun violence to stop the violence of white supremacy. And then finally, there's joyful violence. And next to revolutionary violence, it is perhaps the most important and strongest prong of the four parts that make up a defense for Black personhood. While anti-Black violence has profoundly impacted the African-American historical experience, it is not the totality of Blackness. Unlike whiteness and violence, Blackness can be separated from oppression. Black pride for oneself invokes hope and happiness that can shield one from the demoralizing and degenerative effects of racism. Writer and mother Ashley Simple wrote, quote, some of us fight racism by raising our Black children to know joy. This matters too. As Imani Perry wrote for the Atlantic, racism is terrible, blackness is not. American racism is unquestionably rapacious, he says. To identify the achievement and exhilaration of black life is not to mute or minimize racism, but to shame racism, to damn it to hell. The masters were wrong in the antebellum South when they declared, described the body shaking, delighted chuckle of an enslaved person as simple mindedness. No, that laugh, like our music, like our language, like our movement, was a testimony that refused the terms of our degradation. 
She added in the footage of the protest, this was in 2020, we have seen Black people dancing and chanting, singing, do not misunderstand. This is not the absence of grief or rage or distraction, it is insistence. The four parts of violence is not about revenge. The work of revenge is ridiculous. Vengeance is a white imaginary project. Black people are not consumed with revenge, but justice. And white people are not afraid of revenge, they are afraid of justice because justice is more costly. In protecting Black humanity, violence is not a vice, but a virtue in combating an evil and detestable system. I also recognize that violence is not the solution or meant to be sustainable. It is simply meant to stop an onslaught of violence by white terrorist terrorists. Black response to white terror is about enforcing an interruption. It stuns the oppressor into a pause. So yes, we can legitimately root for the historical heroes in this book. We can and should champion their courage to fight back, slap down, and tear up white supremacy. Too often, white people are more horrified by Black people's attempts to defend themselves than by what or whom they are defending themselves against. Because white Americans have been trained to view Black people through criminality, all their actions and behavior feels like crime. Prison abolitionist Miriam Kaba brilliantly argued, not all crimes are harms and not all harms are crimes. What matters most is not the crime. What matters most is what is harmful. Historically and daily white people cause harm, but are rarely held accountable for harms or crimes. The white doctor who propositioned my great grandmother may have not committed a crime. Naysayers might even point out Mary Bullard's willingness to relinquish her daughter. The point of the oath of a doctor is first do no harm. The doctor's solution posed more harm than a rusty nail. The stories offered here are racial healers and medics called to the battlefield. These are the stories of Black women and men who use non-traditional remedies, force, and even violence to arrest and heal the harms of white supremacy. Throughout history, we have gathered every remedy in our cupboard, every plant in our gardens, and like my ancestor, chosen life with a limp as opposed to the social death of white supremacy. Black people are in search of a remedy, and I confess that I do not have a roadmap, but I do believe that it is better to know where to go and not know how than know how to go and not know where. White supremacy is on a path of domination and death with no destination. So let's work to get everyone freedom. I think the past is our roadmap. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Really interesting. And, and looking forward to your book, actually. I would love to, to see it when it's out. And, uh, and maybe you can give a, 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 another presentation on it. But really very interesting angles that you've explored there. So we'll get to some questions um, uh, and we've got about 20 minutes or so left. Um, uh, Jeremy, the first question is from Sean Stars, one of our colleagues in the department and a friend of the webinar. He asks, uh, oh, sorry, the question is for Uma first, sorry. Um, and it, basically the import of his question is that uh, although the US is obviously pushing weaponry onto many states and so on, uh, but also there's a kind of internal demand from several states for those kinds of weapons. So to what extent would you kind of, uh, if you were to apportion kind of responsibility for the export and use of those kind of military uh, forces and weapons and technologies, to what extent would you distribute it outside of the United States as well as a demand? Uh, I think that's an excellent question from uh, Dr. Stars. I saw the question, so uh, I'd written out uh, my answer. You know. Uh, I agree that there, there has to be a certain amount of nuance to uh, what I said. Uh, and yes, uh, many of these countries do want American weapons, but then they're also conditioned to believe that American weapons are superior to all the other alternatives, right? I mean, for instance, in the case of um, you know, India, for instance, we have been very dependent on Russian arms. We are still dependent on Russian arms. And uh, despite American pressure, 
we are still going ahead with purchases of, of uh, Russian arms because we feel they are good alternatives for us, money-wise probably, mm. or also because we are more experienced in using that. So I think it's also a question of whether you have the alternatives in, in place mm. and, and whether those alternatives are competitive enough. Mm. I mean, the U US is ahead of all its competitors uh, by a very, very long shot. So mm. I think it's also a question of, uh, you know, uh, alternate or, or finding competitive mm. alternatives. So it's uh, so that is why uh, mm. you know countries would want to buy more and more American weapons rather than Chinese or Russian weapons, which are seen as you know not mm. really being as good as American weapons. Yeah, it's interesting. So I would, in regard to Ukraine, for example, now uh, where there's an intense pressure uh, for for India to to join on side and put sanctions on oil and so on, as well as arms, I assume. Uh, where does India find itself? Because it finds itself in quite a quandary in a way. It's a member of the Quad. Uh, it uh, has anxieties about China, therefore is reliant on the United States. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it has these linkages and connections to a far lesser degree probably with Russia. So what is the thing here? Is India just sort of, is this a, the activities of a weak power? Or is this a, a more ambitious thing than that is a kind of assertion? of its great power? Uh, well, I think it's the latter really, because I think uh, there is a lot of debate even within the uh, foreign policy establishment as well as among academics. And a lot of them are of course pro-Americans uh, who, who say that, you know, uh, we, are, we are letting go of this great liberal experiment by not supporting the Americans. Mm. Uh, but then uh, you, you mentioned China as being one of the factors in uh, in why India should support the United States or you know support uh, or, you know ditch uh, Russia as it were. But the point is after the skirmishes between India and China in 2020-21 during the Galwan skirmishes, uh, the only country which actually uh, provides uh, us and the Chinese a platform to talk and end the skirmishes was Russia. Right, and if you look at our territories as well, it is geographically contiguous. You know, you have India on top of it, you have China, and the Chinese have this very, very long border with the Russians. Mm. So, uh, so India is a continental power. We cannot wish away the fact that you know, if the Russians and the Chinese do come together, we are going to be in very, very deep power and the, the, mm. uh, in trouble. And the United States is far away from us. The so we wouldn't want to really damage. Uh, whatever goodwill we have with the Russians. And the Russians are also not too happy with the Chinese becoming more superior to them or rising above that. So I think we want to use that kind of, uh, the, that kind of uh, you know, slight divergence between the Russians and the Chinese to ensure that they don't really come together or push the Russians again into the Chinese embrace. Uh, so I think there are a lot of uh, issues uh, which I think the West is, I think, uh, beginning to realize that there is, there is a reason why India has behaved mm. the way it is and not completely uh, supporting the liberal project as it were. Right. Yeah, it is interesting. I'll be reading a little bit more about the non-aligned movement and also the Bandung period and prior to that as well. And it does seem to me that to some extent, the non-aligned kind of character of Indian foreign policy has been exaggerated as a sort of cover for much more greater power ambitions, which, which Ed has exhibited as well. But uh, thank you for that. Um, Jeremy, there's a question from Sean for you as well. And uh, basically he's, you, can you see it on the Q&A? Yeah, I, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, that, that's yeah. a great question. Um, <laughs> well, I, I thought of uh, uh, you know, Malcolm The US X. being the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, as MLK said. I'm just reading it for the rest of the, the audience. Sorry, go on. Oh, oh go, go ahead and read it then. No, no, go ahead. That's fine. That's fine. They can I'm see sure. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, and the way it's framed, yeah. Uh, very well. Um, well, I I, know, I, I thought of because uh, yeah, I, I did a, an article on the assassination of Malcolm X, uh, and there's you know it's been in the news recently that two uh, uh, one of the people was exonerated uh, who they claim assassinated him. But you know, uh, in doing that research, I, I read one of the speeches where he kind of commented that you know on the uh, you know American liberals and how I mean they go so far, I mean, they'll, you know, they'll offer sympathy for certain causes, but, you know, time that's maybe kind of lukewarm or maybe more, uh, you know, to, you know, burnish their own image or something or some kind of do-gooder, 
And when it got, I mean, I think what X was saying, you know, they look at Congo, you know, they won't say anything about Africa and all the, you know, looting uh, of multinational corporations and neo-colonialism. And I think his explanation was that, I mean, they, they're, they're tied into the system. You know, they, they have investment, you know, they may have direct investments. I mean, they, they may be working for corporations or, uh, you know, that have investments in uh, countries in Africa or Asia or Latin America. Uh, or, I mean, they may live, you know, a relatively comfortable lifestyle. Uh, I think, the, you know, Kelly's presentation showed, I mean, uh, for all the economic problem in the United States, there's still a you know, sizable middle class who live very you know, comfortable and good life. So they don't want to take their critique too far. I mean, they maybe want to tinker with the system and maybe there are certain causes they take up, but often, you know, they may take up certain safe causes and they don't want to really, uh, you know, challenge the thrust of U.S. imperialism because, and maybe at a subconscious level, uh, you know, they've, they've lived a good life and they don't want their own living standard to, to decline. And realistically, it might. I mean, if the U.S., you know, the U.S. empire, you can debate it. I mean, and some would argue there are a lot of negative uh, domestic ramifications, you know, including with the military industrial complex. And what Eisenhower said, it takes money out of uh you know, school that takes money out of, you know, children who aren't fed, who aren't clothed. Um, but that's still more the underclass, you know, it may be suffered the most. Uh, you know, there are many people who benefited from the U.S. empire, including the multinational corporation. You know, main purpose has been to open up opportunity for U.S. corporations or people, you know, a huge number of people work for the military or military-related industry. So my answer would be probably it's, it's at either at a subconscious level or, you know, directly they understand that they do benefit uh, off U.S. foreign policies and they don't want to challenge it too much. They might, you know, certain, the Iraq war, you know, goes on too long and it looks really bad and they're going to, you know, say, all right, end this thing, but they're not going to you know, challenge the thrust of it. So that would be my answer. And some of it is conditioning. I mean, the media is very powerful influence, uh, conditions people to think certain ways. And we can see that now with Ukraine, you know, it's uh, day in, day out. It's been for years, you know, demonizing the Russians and, and people eventually buy into it. Uh, and, you know, I was following that carefully and, you know, public opinion polls show like in 20, in the early 2000s, majority of Americans, uh, there were polls that said, uh, you know, do you want Russia to be a friendly term with the United States? And the majority said yes. And do you think of Russia as a security threat? And the majority said no. But by 2020, like 50 to 60 or maybe 70 percent said Russia is a great threat. And, you know, we have to take a hard line. And a lot of that is because the media over years has been and including a lot of liberal outlets that target more liberal educated audience, middle class, like MSNBC with the Maddow show has hit on the Russia, uh, evil Russia for, for years now. And those programs have an impact among some people uh, conditioning them. So that's an added factor. Mm. Jeremy, just to, just to press you a little bit on the Ukraine thing, you said uh, earlier on about the various kind of uh, military uh, intelligence and other agencies, American ones, which have uh, been in Ukraine. Uh, can I just take the opportunity, and also you have obviously a historical background of American uh, military support and aid and interventions as well in different parts of the world. Um, where do you see the Ukraine, the Russia-Ukraine conflict going? Uh, where do you, what do you see as the kind of immediate and long-term aims of the United States in that particular conflict? Uh, I think you made the point. I think the aim are pretty clear is to weaken and, and uh, promote regime change within Russia. I think it's the Brzezinski strategy that they used in Afghanistan, where he bragged about, uh, you know, uh, coaxing the Russians to invade after, you know, it was acknowledged later that the U.S. had supported the Mujahideen in Afghanistan years before, you know, starting in the, I think, 1977 or so, and that the purpose was to draw in the Russians to their Vietnam and, you know, bleed the Soviet empire, and he bragged later we you know, brought down the Soviet empire and they asked him about the Taliban, Islamic fundamentalism. He said, ah, oh, that's nothing. Uh, and I think it's a Brzezinski mindset uh, pervade the upper level of the US government, uh, that it's all about you know, geopolitical shaming and the, the human uh, cost is, is not considered. And you know, they hate Putin. The, the reason they hate him is because you know, after the Soviet Union fell, 
um, they saw a great opportunity to dominate the entire region, you know, the Eurasian region. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Brzezinski was, uh, you know, drew on earlier international relations scholars who saw dominant of the Eurasian heartland as the key to global domination, yeah, including some British mm -hmm. imperial strategists in an earlier period. Uh, and they saw this tremendous opportunity with the fall of the Soviet Union. And then they had, you know, Boris Yeltsin was uh, a leader who was kind of acquiescent to U.S. interests largely and was, um, you know, a weak leader from a Russian point of view and enabled U.S. corporations to uh, seize uh, significant part, you know, or, you know, they're moving more and more to take control for the privatization process of Russian industry and resources. And Putin came in as Yeltsin's successor and initially was very friendly uh, to the United States, but slowly he shifted and became more nationalistic. You know, he stood up to certain US designs and he went after some of the oligarchs starting in the early 2000s. I mean, he has his own circle of oligarchs, but he went after some of the big oligarchs who had uh, benefited from the shock therapy privatization. Uh, and then he, you know, slowly, I think, changed to becoming more, seeing the U.S., especially after the Libyan, the overthrow of Gaddafi, he became afraid that he could be a target, and he aligned, you know, more with China and started standing up uh, to the U.S. more and more, speaking out in international forum, like starting a Munich uh, conference in Munich, I think 2008 or so. Um, uh, so at that point, the U.S., I think, ramped up efforts to remove him. Uh, you know, and he was trying to make a stronger Russia, a more you know aggressive, uh, in, 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 in you know grow, uh, you know as far as uh, drawing in you know having this having more centralized system. I mean, in Georgia, he was you know moving to annex certain provinces and then with Crimea. So I mean, he's trying to build a stronger Russia, align with China. I mean, I think the goal is to establish more multipolar world order. And the U.S. will do everything to try and, you know, uh, sustain a unipolar American world order and see Putin as a threat, uh, you know, taking back control to a certain extent, uh, Russian control over its economy. So they've ramped up regime change e efforts. Mm -hmm. And I think Ukraine is part of that. I mean, is a key part of that. It was outlined in the Rand Corporation report, mm -hmm. uh, like 2018 or so. And the report was called Trying to Unbalance Russia. And it basically talked about strategies for regime change, including the sanctions. And I think mm -hmm. the goal for Ukraine was to provoke Russia because the US clearly uh, provoked Russia uh, into invading, uh, starting with the Maidan coup of 2014, uh, the Ukrainian uh, attacks on Eastern Ukraine, the uh, push for NATO expansion. All of these policies uh, provoked the Russians. And I think they understood that Russia, the goal was probably to induce a Russian invasion, just like in Afghanistan. And that would, you know, they could ratchet up the sanctions, they, they would facilitate a quagmire, they would pass all these bills to ramp up military funding. So it would create a quagmire in Ukraine. And then that would weaken Putin. And then the opposition would go stronger uh, with the Russian economy collapsing under sanctions. I think that's their plan. But I don't think it's working because the public opinion polls show that Putin's popularity is stronger since the war started. And Russia has been adept at maneuvering around the sanctions and is actually kind of countering the West, like even with the, you know, with its growing alliance with China and like even the financial sector, where they're trying to, you know, cut off Russian banks uh, and, and cut off the SWIFT system. <laughs> Russia has developed, uh, its, uh, you know, with China, a alternative, uh, you know, communication system among the financial institutions. And they're moving towards, you know, pushing uh, uh, for alternative current, you know, uh, using the Russian ruble or an alternative to the American dollar. And they've solidified their trading ties, you know, with uh, uh, China and other uh, countries around them. Uh, so it seems to be kind of backfiring uh, that Russia is not, you know, uh, and so that's why I, I think many analysts are predicting a potential geopolitical uh, shift that this war is actually weakening and, and with the rise in oil price and inflation and the threat of a food crisis, it's actually adversely affecting Western economies, uh, possibly more than the Russian economy. So it's actually a kind of suicidal policy that the U.S. is pursuing. And, and we see a, a kind of growing, uh, you know, uh, a dichotomy where the elites in the United States are so cut off from their own people and they're carrying out uh, policy that are ultimately possibly suicidal. Uh, so... But it's, it's a very dangerous situation. I mean, it could lead to a nuclear war.
Russia's on nuclear alert. Who knows how far each side would go in pursuing this? So I think you know we're seeing um, the fruition of a very dangerous uh, policy uh, by the United States. You know, a, a century of, of of imperialistic policies are starting to blow back more and more and causing a very dangerous world environment. All right, thank you. Really interesting full answer. Uh, Oz, did you want to come in on this question? Yeah, I, I did actually. I just wanted to sort of try and try and pull some of the threads that, uh, oh. uh, that we spoke about together. Hmm. And I guess for me, and, and I'd like to hear sort of all, all, all voices on this, is that it strikes me that from Kelly's talk, that actually, at the you know, we're talking about the violent American century, that it's that mixture of racism and capitalism coming together that hmm. seems to be creating this dichotomy. And then Uma's talk seems to be sort of suggesting the same, but on the international sphere. And it's suggesting that there's this really big tension that's playing out, um, if you like, between race and capitalism and repression, whether that's occurring at home or abroad. And that that in itself is giving rise to tensions between, in effect, what look like blocks of imperialism. And I know Jeremy spoke about imperialists and anti-imperialists in the 1950s and so forth. So I guess the question then becomes that, you know, these imperialists strike me not just as white supremacists, but, of, you know, often have a core of that. But I guess the question to the panel is, well, where do we see it going from here? Because it seems to me that the, 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 the imperialist part of the agenda, the, the part that focuses on race and capitalism and combining the two for advantage, is, is much larger than the part, and I thought your phrasing um, was fantastic, Kelly, where you referred to, um, you know, the sort of coalition uh, about folks, to, you know, the, in the defence of black personhood. I thought that was really interesting. But it doesn't strike me that that coalition is particularly large. It strikes me that perhaps these dynamics, and this goes back to what Jeremy said a moment ago um, about, you know, folks, middle class white folks not necessarily seeing this. So I wonder if we could just sort of have a, a, a little sort of conversation about, you know, where are these coalitions? What needs to sort of happen in order to sort of bring these folks together? Or do we just see this sort of imperialist agenda and violence sort of continuing ad nauseum? Maybe Kelly, you can have a go at this one. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. I mean, I think that we have two things happening simultaneously. On one hand, you have white supremacy. On the other hand, you have anti-Blackness. And I don't see those same things necessarily as the same thing. I think it's worth teasing out that when we look at white supremacy, when we look at its goal of like, uh, whiteness as supreme domination power and how that manifests itself and sort of the corollary aspect of that like who bears the brunt of that oppression is anti-blackness and you have two of those things working sort of hand in hand so while most people might um uh, say they abhor white supremacy they're not as troubled by anti-blackness right and it's and it's something that's a part of the problem as well um and so these are things that i think have to be attacked simultaneously alongside mm. capitalism but i think it's so difficult for us to think outside of the box because we've been so conditioned to believe that capitalism is a solution that wealth can save us that finances can save us or philanthropy can save us and those things have proven not to be solutions and so um really compelling people to sort of reimagine or recreate a different kind of space um is why i talk about like revolution because it's a replacement of something we've seen that these things over centuries have not worked that they hurt people, that they harm people. So now we have to rethink, um, rethink these systems, which is why I think a lot of the rhetoric of today is like, you know, defund the police or abolish the police or abolish, you know, prisons and things of that nature is because people want new systems. And what I think is so helpful about history is that it's instructive in that when you can think about the prison system itself and say like, it hasn't always been with us. It, it's not something that's been around since the dawn of time. So if we haven't always had 
prisons mm -hmm. per se, then we can imagine what a world might be like without it. And I think it's the same thing with capitalism. I think it's the same thing with all of these other big ideas is that not all of these things have been around since the dawn of time that we can imagine worlds and spaces in which everyone has something. I think we also have to change the narrative about what forfeiture looks like and what reparations looks like because I think for too many of us have believed this idea that like a job for you was a job taken away from me or you know a house for you means homelessness for me and that's not what forfeiture means um it means a redistribution of of wealth so that everybody has a base that is um that is humane and we don't know how to navigate that territory because we don't have a narrative that supports what real equality and equity looks like on the ground hmm. so so it's, it's interesting it's so <coughs> that you talk about revolution and other forms um of inaugurating change or trying to um does that mean and the last bit that you said about uh redistribution what are the, what are the kind of political or alliances or coalitions mm. which would be required for the kind of thing that you're talking about. Does that cut across racial and class groups as well? Or? I think so. I mean, I think, uh, um, I'm forgetting of the author's name, she wrote um, The Some of Us. But basically, she her argument is that poor Black people, poor white people, uh, poor brown people have a lot in common, a lot in common. And it's really white supremacy that keeps these divisions mm -hmm. from creating coalitions, from creating real uh, solidarity across the board that could create policy, demand policy, that could change and drastically alter, I think, the trajectory that we've, uh, we're on. And I think we've seen this before, too. If you go back to, like, Bacon's Rebellion, you you had real coalitions with white, uh, poor white Americans and enslaved Black Americans and free Black Americans and even Native Americans. Um, and we see how race becomes the great uh, dividing line and class to some extent, right? Or even the um, idea that you can attain, eventually you can attain a million dollars. You too can be wealthy. That lie, that fantasy that people have bought in that if they just keep climbing that they can get this too and then I don't have to worry about all these other poor people, that's also another problem. So I think race plays into it, class plays into it. But when you pull all that away, the interest that poor people of color have, that marginalized people of color have, is so great and so enormous. Um, I think we could be powerful if we if we saw our common interests together. But um, but I'm not, you know, um, I'm not naive. I know that racism is seductive. You know, capitalism is seductive. It's really hard to untether yourself from these ideas and these hopes about, you know, what you can gain or what you can attain. Um, and so that that's the, the struggle. So as a historian, I'm constantly trying to shift the narrative to get people to see like, no, something else is actually possible. Well, we're, we're out of time, actually. But uh, if, if, if we could please indulge me just one last time. Um, it seems to me that the heart of uh, sort of the American power elite is very much in terms of sort of divide and rule. Mm -hmm. And that operates at home as much as it operates internationally. And, mm -hmm. and I just wonder, a uh, question for Jeremy and for Uma perhaps to, to wrap up, is that what do you think is the kind of the, the real driving force behind uh, American power, which sort of leads to the kind of outcomes that you are, that you are, you know, you spoke about. Mm. Because Uma, you talked about the military industrial complex, but a lot of corporations would argue uh, uh, that they're not supported by war, that they, they're disrupted by it. Mm. So is the military industrial complex, in your view, the dominant sort of block within the American sort of capitalism, American multinational and other corporations? That is the kind of core power and driver. And I guess, Jeremy, what, what is your own view about, because you talked about how the Cold War and the Soviet threat and so on were kind of, kind of constructed. So is, the, is there like an imperial project which you're claiming um, uh, that actually constructs threats along the lines Umo talked about as well as a cover for 
that expansionism and that therefore the kind of you know racial superiority racial blocks class solidarities and so on across states are sort of mobilized behind that broader project i don't know i don't know Uma, maybe you want to briefly have a go yeah uh, but i i think it's a uh, corporate uh, also in addition to this i think you have the bureaucracy we have this really bloated bureaucracy in the united states which mm -hmm. You know, uh, buys into these corporates, or they they lobby for the corporates, on, uh, and you know they are entrenched bureaucracies in a sense. You know, particularly the aid lobby. Mm -hmm. you now they need to make themselves relevant. So you st start manufacturing, uh, you know, threats, for instance, or conflicts to stay relevant in the game. I think, uh, and, and this, and the United States has always had this great imperial project of remaining the sole superpower, and it's done that throughout what you call this violent history, a uh, violent uh, century that it has done. So uh, I think it's it's a bit of both as well, uh, but uh, we should not discount the uh, the uh, the power of the, the American bureaucracy, not just to corporate, but also the bureaucracy, I think. Right, so the state machine uh, itself is, uh, is deep, a really deep, deep, deep part state. of that correlation, yeah. Um, uh, Jeremy, Last yeah, I, I agree with Uma. Yeah, she makes good points. And yeah, I, I know there's a book I read a while back called The Rising American Empire uh, by, uh, it was written like 1960 and it analyzed the writings of uh, Richard von Alstein. It analyzed the um, writings of the founding fathers and it found that they all aspired to be a new empire from the beginning. Uh, even Jefferson, you know, they wanted to be the new Rome and uh, so I think there's maybe a cultural element too, you know, from the beginning, uh, and maybe tied to you know racial superiority over non-white peoples, and it was you know constant. If you follow the trajectory of American history, it's constantly expansionist from the beginning, you know, taking over the North American continent from the natives, and subjugating the the African Americans. Uh, and then moving abroad when the you know once they got strong enough and the frontier was closed, they moved into Asia. So it's a constant thread. And I mean, there's certainly economic interests and class interests driving it. There are bureaucracies uh, that benefit from it. And, and there may be some cultural imperative that other historians could explain. Uh, one who explained it was, uh, there's a good book, Gunfighter Nation by Richard Slotkin. There's a brilliant cultural analysis I can recommend. Mm. Thank you. And, and I, I guess in a way, you know, what Kelly's arguing as well, you, you, if you apply Lenin's idea of the labor aristocracy back to the United States and we extend it somewhat, then we see that there is actually a benefit for quite a, a, a not very broad range, but certainly benefits of imperialism for certain segments at home who then become a kind of political constituency for that kind of uh, uh, advanced or forward uh, aggressive kinds of policies as well. Yeah. And we they are, control right. the media uh, so they right. can, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And that Rand report you were talking about extending Russia uh, is actually absolutely Machiavellian to the extreme and very interesting indeed. I've been looking at some of that in the, lately as well. But thank you so much, everyone. We have gone a bit over time, but um, hopefully the uh, we've got some really interesting points of view, which we had a bit more time to discuss as well. But fantastic panel, um, really good um, presentations and the handling of the Q&A as well. And thanks Oz also for tying many sort of strands together too. So I wanna say thank you to the audience. We're gonna see you again next week, same time. And next week, we're gonna look at the America as an empire of knowledge. That, and that just like Uma was saying, that there's not just, there's not a like a brick wall or a Chinese wall between uh, ordinary aid and military aid and so on, I think we can see how that, how lethal knowledge can be for empires as how it is used. So we're going to have three great panelists. I can't remember their names right now, but uh, I'm sure I will remember during the course of the week. We will be advertising it in the usual ways. So please join us again next week. And uh, once again, thanks everyone on the panel, Jeremy, Kelly, and Uma. Fantastic panel. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to write us a uh, a short blog of uh, some of your reflections as well, which we'll put up on our website. We recorded this webinar and we'll put that out shortly as well. So thanks very much and um, see you again uh, some other time in or certainly yeah. next week.
Bye. Great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.